So if you're open to John chapter 19, so uh, we will be reading the entire chapter, mainly focusing on the first 22 verses, but we'll be reading through the first, uh, well, we'll be reading through the whole chapter. So John 19, all right, the text reads, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hand. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man! Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. He went again into the Praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. That was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, uh, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went up to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of, Jew, the King of the Jews. <clears throat> then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I, I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from, uh, from the top in one piece. They said, Therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. And the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. And they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, and said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took him, uh, took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that, uh, that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for, the Sabbath was a, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with his spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. 
So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. <coughs> and they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he, he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because it was Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. That is uh, your text. And so uh, before we go a little bit deeper into exploring a little bit more about Pilate, as well as the significance of uh, his role in the crucifixion, as well as the crucifixion, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that it is finished. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you that it's completed. Thank you that we can look to you for hope. Lord, that uh, we can't do it in our own strength, but God. You have provided a way back to you. God, help our heart be one of response to you in good hope and in faith, uh, accepting you as our Lord and Savior, and our only hope back to you. So God, thank you so much for your provision, and we just pray for this message. Just God, uh, help it be marrow to our bones, and um, just help it strengthen us spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. Pilate was a governor or a prefect of Judah during the time of Jesus' ministry. A prefect is Roman terminology for <coughs> governor. A lot of times the prefect would have military uh, governance as well, and that, that was the main emphasis. Uh, many scholars actually believe that Pilate was just a fictional character put in there to further the story and the propaganda of Christianity. Uh, and so kind of a literary license, but... Uh, that changed quite a bit in 1961 when some excavation was done around Caesarea Maritima, uh, which is Caesarea by the sea. That was the capital when uh, Pilate was governor. And so uh, there was an inscription on the part of an excavated Roman amphitheater that cites his rulership as well as Tiberius Caesar, kind of dates it too. And so, um, interestingly too, the historian Tacitus also mentions uh, Pontius Pilate uh, and he was a secular historian. So you have that as well as this new excavation. And so uh, scholars don't really have that majority view anymore. <laughs> but the inscription reads, Dis Augustus Tiberium, Pontius, Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilatus, Prefectus Udae, uh, Facet Dedicavit. It's called the Pilate Stone. I'm going to do a little research on that. But translated, if my Latin is okay enough, uh, this is roughly given to Tiberius Augustus Caesar from Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judah, this dedication is given. And so we see the, um, the capital of the region <laughs> and the, uh, the mention of Pilate as well as Tiberius Caesar. So pretty neat. Um, and interestingly, much of Roman history is either buried under ashes or burned to ashes. Um, a lot of disaster. We had the big uh, explosion in Mount Vesuvius and that. So we had the seismic effect there as well as uh, Nero who had the human burning effect burned a lot of books, a lot of, uh, a lot of Roman. So, um, so a great deal of Roman history and its direct accounts have been lost, but we still have stuff that we're excavating and finding out. But anyway, going back to Pilate, Pilate likely means uh, skill with the, with the javelin, which could mean that he was either from a lot of skilled, skilled warriors or even athletes, but probably warrior here since he was prefect. Um, so yeah, they're typically in charge of military matters first, Politics were definitely a large factor, and we see that Pilate was, yeah, he, he wasn't a warrior when it came to standing firm under the pressure of other people. Uh, he was very, uh, to a very real extent, a people pleaser. And um, in living life, he, uh, and especially with partaking in the Christian walk, you can't do that. You gotta uh, be firm on, on the things that are firm and certain. And so, uh, I guess in, in parallel, many today wink at sin, they tolerate injustice. They compromise truth, say that there's multiple paths to God, uh, and what it, and it's just trying to be popular. You know, you're not you trying not to offend anyone. It becomes an idol when you corrupt the message. And so, you know, Jesus, who said, "I'm on the way to God. I'm the only way. Uh, no, no one comes to the Father but by me." John 14, 6. And uh, yeah, it's, we have to tell the world about him. And really, what a detriment it is to to those who need to hear about Jesus if they're just being Pontius Pilate's. But um, is Jesus the only way to God? Yes. 
Um, do we need to repent from sin and live in holiness? Yes. Uh, yet that's compromised quite a bit. Uh, the parallel, if you want to put a band-aid on a bleeding artery, it's not going to work. So, yeah. Um, things degrade, people suffer, we mourn, and we exist through pain, but we can have hope through Jesus. Um, like we discussed last week, he makes all things new. Um, when Pilate had the chance to release Jesus by his own authority, he wanted to make the crowd happy. And even though he had the feelings about, or the feelings of regret and remorse, um, and we see that, that he, he really didn't want to release Barabbas and want to release Jesus. He didn't see anything that he'd done wrong. We see also, uh, I guess, <coughs> first he, um, he had some sense of uh, what he was getting involved in. Uh, Matthew 27, another parallel account of, of this. Um, Matthew 27, 24. It says, When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was arising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of this blood. Uh, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. So really, is, is washing your hands enough? Uh, we can see that Pilate's uh, we can see that Pilate was dealing with a guilty conscience. Uh, his own act of uh, washing his own hands was kind of trying to get rid of that and re getting rid of the guilt. Uh, and a way of proclaiming that he was not guilty. Uh, he saw the zeal of the religious leaders and, and the people who wanted to crucify Jesus uh, and was intimidated. Uh, he was intimidated away from pursuing any other action and releasing Jesus. And uh, this was even though his wife warned him not to have any part in his death. See that uh, five verses prior, Matthew 27, 19. His wife literally told him, you know, don't have anything to, to do against this man, and yet he, he does. Um, he had the do whatever you want type of mentality. And even when the, the Pharisees asked him to, to seal the tomb extremely tight, Pilate also let them do as they wished. Um, and that, we can go both ways on that, but uh, Matthew 27, 65. His pilot said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. And so we see the, the reason and the motive behind Pilate not releasing Jesus was uh, when people kept bringing up Caesar. And you're not a friend of Caesar if you're releasing this man who claims to be a king, as well as uh, the chief priest used that same line. He's like, we have no king but Caesar. It's kind of like, what about you? It's like, are you claiming this guy is a king? So I am. Uh, with that popularity, desire, he did not release Jesus. And, um, yeah. So we see uh, Mark, Mark 15, another parallel. We have a ton of, ton of accounts of that. But um, Mark 15, 12 through 15. Reads, Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to him, uh, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried it all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Pilate's actions were not justified by the fact that God brought about infinite good through the situation. In fact, as we'll explore later, this event shows both the wickedness of those involved in Jesus' death, as well as the ultimate uh, sovereignty of God. Uh, and God allowing these people to reign at the time planned and furthering his desire to provide hope, to provide a sacrifice. Uh, so, where are some other key scripture passages about Pilate? Well, we know that Pilate was governor, the prefect over Jude, uh, Judea. Uh, Luke had this written in the first century AD, yet it took some scholars again until 1961 to believe it. Um, Luke 3, 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Etruria, and the region of Tracon Traconitis, and uh, Lasanius, <coughs> Tetrarch of Avignon. So we have there the most important part of there. We have the Tiberius Caesar mentioned, and just as a historical record, that, that dates it. And then Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. Um, scripture marks Pilate as being against Jesus, and also against some God fearing people. Acts 4 27. Reads, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and people of Israel, were gathered, uh, were gathered together. So we have that picture of Pontius Pilate being part of the crowd who was against Jesus. And that's how uh, that's mentioned in Acts 4. 
Um, also Luke 13, 1, there's kind of this big old question mark, this brief mention of Pontius Pilate. Uh, and it says, Luke 13, 1, there were present at, this, at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's all that's mentioned about that uh, in Scripture. And uh, nothing is explored further uh, in Scripture, though we have an account uh, by Josephus, a historian, a Jewish historian, uh, about uh, what was likely that event that that's, that's referring to. And this is found in uh, his Antiquities, uh, Book 18. Uh, well, apparently Pilate is recorded as having set up a false trip to find items belonging to Moses under a, really, uh, a religious actor. So he essentially set them up to go on this trip because he thought that uh, they were too much against him. And so he set up a trip, kind of like this big old field trip, so that uh, he could uh, set up an ambush. And so he ended up slaughtering many who were accused of being potential dissenters and um, those who weren't even convicted. And so uh, he was going to be brought to trial for that, but I think it was by Tiberius Caesar, but he ended up dying before they could do the trial. And so he kind of got off clean. So it was an unjust killing of people who were, were God-fearers, but those who um, yeah, were just set up because they disagreed with him. Um, Pilate also did things uh, to boost his image. He took some temple funds and, uh, and put them to uh, making an aqueduct to his name. And so he, he was kind of had that contra uh, relationship anyway, but um, kind of the hardness of heart. Uh, but the rule of Pilate, uh, even with that hardness, is rooted in the sovereignty of God. And we know from various passages, notably Romans 13, the New Testament, that God sets up the powers that be. And um, it's not saying that you know, God endorses all that are ruling, but you know, he is sovereign over who is in control at a certain time. So, um, Acts 3.13 reads, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. And uh, see that, again, God was glorifying Jesus, even through the stead of Pilate. Um, and even Jesus recognized the Father's sovereignty in the situation. You see from John 19, 11, back to John 19, there's a, a quote from Jesus, after Pilate said, essentially, do you know who I am? It's like, I have, I have power to release you. I have power to release you and crucify you. And then Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given, given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And Jesus is not saying, yours is not a sin. <laughs> but um, you see the man's responsibility. And likewise, we have responsibility in that. And a lot of things are structured as covenants in Scripture. And so this is not a fatalistic existence. Is that the way we act, we're going to have to give an account. Remember from 2 Corinthians 5, we're all going to have to give an account for everything that we, we do. So we have responsibility in this life. And how we act is going to be taken to taken to pass. Uh, but we also have the elements of God's sovereignty and that he has all things for a purpose. And you see the kind of... Uh, superficial comment where some athletes would be like, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. It's kind of the case, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, but that's not what, that's not what it is. It's not quite like that. We see that we have responsibility, but God also, uh, again, like Romans 8, 28, for those who love him, he works everything out for him for our good. And so, um, for example, in, in Joseph's case, you see that his brothers dumped them in a well and uh, wanted to get rid of him because they were jealous of, um, well, his visions as well as his status with his dad. And so um, they dumped him in the well, but God made a, a situation in which he had a big plan to have Joseph be the one to bring about prosperity during the time of famine for the Israelites. So, um, yeah, so God provides even, even through situations that don't really make sense. Um, so God's sovereignty. The key idea there, God put the right people in the right place at the right time in order to carry out his plan. And so that's a, a big lesson from even Pilate and the crucifixion. Um, so we see God had many corrupt priests in power, many corrupt and egotistical officials who cared more about their reputation 
for the people than the consequences of their actions. And so all these factors coming together, they come together nicely to bring about God's promise of hope to all people. We see the promise, Genesis 3.15, called the Protevangelium, the first proclamation of the good news. In Genesis 3.15, all the way back after the first sin, we have God saying, I will put enmity, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And what is, is being spoken to the serpent, Satan, who would bruise Jesus' heel, crucifixion. But, um, but we have uh, Jesus crushing the head of Satan. And so, um, we have the, the parallel there that Jesus was he, he had power over the grave. He was not guilty of sin. He was not worthy of death. So as God was pleased to show his approval of the sacrifice by raising him from the dead. And so um, it's also a symbol showing us that um, through, yeah, it's, it's a symbol that uh, through Jesus we can also partake in the resurrection from the dead and share with him in the inheritance of, of heaven. All right, so so far, what we've talked about, <laughs> so we've discussed uh, man's responsibility. We see Pilate being responsible for his actions and being guilty of his sin, but we see also God's sovereignty in allowing those people to, to be in power and uh, God to carry out his, his ultimate plan, uh, despite the wickedness of the people. So, first proclamation of hope. I'll put enmity or discord or dissent between you and the woman and between your seed and her, her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. That parallel there. Cool. So even though uh, Jesus' heel was bruised by the crucifixion, Satan's head was crushed. His power is defeated by the resurrection and uh, his sacrifice for us. So ever since the first sin, God proclaimed hope. About 740 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah declared, and you can go ahead and turn to Isaiah 53. We'll be dealing with this text for a little while. Noting some observations from Isaiah. So, Isaiah 53. Remember, this is 740 years before Jesus. All right, so Isaiah 53, starting with verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him in grief, and you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. And so a lot of people say that this is about the country Israel. But it seems to have a further definitive focus on a single man. Note, uh, this is understood as well in Acts 8 as a passage about Jesus. Um, and it definitely fits. See uh, the language here. Uh, even in terms of just God's sovereignty. Um, he was smitten by God, verse 4. Uh, the Lord was, uh, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we see that he was our, essentially our scapegoat Remember from Leviticus um, that you know a goat would you know, the priest would lay the hands on the goat and he would be sent out to the wilderness uh, and that was uh, laying on that goat the iniquity 
uh, the sins of the people. And the iniquity is, uh, let's see, you have, you have the iniquity, the, the willful disobedience against God. You have the transgression, which uh, it's kind of the three degrees of, of the terms in, in, in Hebrew. You have uh, sin, which is hata, and you have um, transgression. Um, you don't remember that one. And then the other one is uh, iniquity, which is avon. And the iniquity is the most severe, and, and talking about that, and um, just the willful disobedience against God. And so even the worst of our sins is still a category of sin, but it's definitely the worst. And the Lord has laid on him even the worst of what we've done. Uh, and so essentially, whatever you've done, it's not too big for what God can forgive. Um, so that's important. Uh, verse 10, we also see that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put into grief. It's not saying that you know, God's a masochist or he's cruel, but um, just imagine that and you're thinking, how much would you love your, your only only son? And yet he gave up his only son to bring us back to him because he loved us so much that he wanted us to be back, at, uh, to be reconciled with, with him in peace. And uh, we have that, that image from scripture that you know, we were the enemies of God, and yet God had so much love for us, even as his enemies, that he uh, gave us a sacrifice to lead them back to himself. So, uh, Acts 2, verses 22 through 24, we see in the New Testament, uh, God's sovereignty as well. And uh, keep, keep in Isaiah 53, I'll just read you this, this blurb uh, from Acts. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the de uh, determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And so look again at Isaiah 53. We, we have Old and New Testament speaking to God delighting and raising Jesus from the dead and offering him as a sacrifice for our sins. The reasons and results of this sacrifice. <clears throat> in verse 6, he was chastised for our peace. He goes back to God. Um, you remember last week from Ephesians 2, we discussed that as well. Um, that you know, even though we were uh, once estranged from God by our sins, he has broken down every wall that uh, Jew and Gentile can come to know Jesus. That we, uh, we were formerly aliens and uh, outside, outcasts, and yet God brought us back and made peace through the blood of Jesus. See verse 6, by his stripes we are healed. That uh, this is most directly speaking toward uh, our forgiveness from sin. Uh, but we also believe that you know, Jesus does heal us. So, bless you. Um, so, yeah, take that how you will, but... Um, that God is our healer as well. And he has healed us from our sins, just an extension of, of that healing. Um, verse 8, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And uh, so the, the forgiveness aspect, as well as verse 11, that many will be justified because he bore our iniquities. And so again, is this passage just about the people of Israel? Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's also, it's referring to a single person, singular um, singular man who would live a life and uh, be punished and crushed for our iniquities. Israel was not crucified for our sins. Israel didn't take the place of our sins. Yet we have one who is the king of king of Israel, king of the Jews, who who was he was the man who God chose, who was the son of God, and uh, who he had as a like for like sacrifice. So this passage is about Jesus. Again, remember the Acts eight news and good reading about the Ethiopian man. That's what he was reading in his uh, little carriage when Philip came up to him and explained this is about Jesus, the Messiah. So remember, man has responsibility, God has sovereignty. Also, we can celebrate the provision and what has been done. Uh, so through the, uh, through the crucifixion was an act of treachery and killing of an innocent man. Uh, God, in, uh, God in a very real way had the priest sacrifice Jesus. Um, yet the message isn't, what a poor man. That's uh, an image you can carry away that isn't, you know, isn't directly on the mark. That Jesus wasn't just some poor man who was killed. Um, and while it was sad that you know, this man was put to death, but God had a reason for it. So the sadness there 
uh, is overshadowed by, by hope. And the message is Jesus, the Son of God, has given his life for us uh, and laid it down so that we can be forgiven and free. That's the, the main thrust of the gospel. It's the main point. Uh, remember last week we discussed 2 Corinthians 5. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we could be made the righteousness of God through him. You see the substitution there. And I have a little uh, triple illustration, so I'll get this out here. Hopefully this doesn't spill. That would stink. <clears throat> right, so the three cups of water. So the, the, each one of these cups represents our life. Our lives. Each individual. And so uh, Romans 5 discusses that through one man sin entered the world. And so these drops are representative of sin. We have uh, the pure man's sin entered the world. And so each one of us is born, we're under the curse, we're under fallenness, and um, yeah, it's red, it's starting to get a little bit red. And if you mix it up, it's not clear anymore. It's transparent, I guess more accurately translucent, but it's not clear anymore. So each one of us lives life. Romans 3.23 says that the wages of sin is death, or all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that the wages <coughs> of sin is death. And so, say this person lived a life and he told a lie, he cheated on a test, but okay, he sinned, he disobeyed God's commands, he's unfairly stolen the, the answers, he's... Uh, or false witness against his neighbor. So literally the law shows us that, that we disobey God, that we're guilty of sin. James 4 also says that uh, if we, or rather James 2, James 2.10, says uh, if we disobey one commandment, we're guilty of breaking the law, the entire law. And that's true. So this guy is a lawbreaker. He's disobeyed God's law. This guy, well, he committed adultery. He, uh, he also stole, he robbed banks all the time and just as guilty of every possible sin he could commit. But what's the what's the likeness here? If they're they're both red, they're both lawbreakers. And so what we need is uh, is hope. And what we have through Jesus is uh, a man came without sin. He he lived a life without sin. And he was not under the curse of, of mankind. You know, he was fully man, but he was also fully God. And so he was not under the curse of sin. He was not stained by that. He, uh, and so his, his sinlessness uh, made him the perfect sacrifice. And so uh, when you have Jesus, you have uh, kind of an exchange that goes on. And so pretend each one of these drops is the worst poison you can find. And it's not really just food coloring, but it's representative of it. But any single drop, regardless of how little or how much, you're not going to want to drink this. And so 2 Corinthians 5, again, you know, everything we do is going to be taken. Uh, it's going to be judged uh, either at the great white throne, as mentioned in Revelation, or at the judgment seat of Christ. And so the hope is that we live as pure lives as we can, but we can't be perfect. We can't reach God in our own strength. And so what we have through Jesus is he lived a sinless life. And as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. That we, okay, so that, that first part. If if this man who is a crook, a liar, a, an adulterer, if he comes to know Jesus, if he, if he uh, repents of his sin, if he confesses it and turns from it, and he accepts Jesus as his sacrifice, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we could become the righteousness, righteousness of God. And so this man, too, he can, he can repent. And Jesus took on all our sin at Calvary on the cross. And um, the beauty of that is we can all share in his sinlessness. The second part of that verse is so that we could become the righteousness of God. And so when we believe in Jesus, when we've accepted him, accepted his sacrifice, received his forgiveness, we have his holiness and his righteousness that God sees us as he sees his son Jesus. And so it is finished. It is forgiven. So it's been done for us. We can't 
uh, reached God in our own strength. We can't do enough good things. Uh, we can be a moral person, but we can totally miss the mark and still be guilty as lawbreakers. And so that is an illustration. Um, Chris, could you pass out the uh, bread? And uh, in celebrating Jesus' uh, sacrifice tonight, we will uh, partake in communion together. So as he passes that out, just uh, meditate and focus on the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us.